All right, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming. It's good to see you. It's, we count down to the end here with only uh, two more weeks left to go. Uh, the subject of our discussion uh, today is Chapter 10, which is uh, Improving Attention and Memory. Um, if you'll recall, last week we, uh, we talked about um, affect and motivation and uh, this sort of thing, and I mentioned at that time there was a great deal of, of uh, overlap between what we consider affect and motivation and then other uh, characteristics that enhance learning, such as uh, attention and memory. We'll even be talking about some other things today that I think interact with those variables as well uh, that really uh, <clears throat> work together uh, in, in, a, in every child at all points in time to determine whether or not learning occurs. And I don't think you can look at attention all by itself or memory all by itself or motivation all by itself without uh, taking into consideration the impact that some of these variables have on one another. And uh, I want to focus your attention on this whole issue of, of attention and memory by having you reflect back on when uh, you may have been younger or maybe even now, I don't know, and may find yourself in church or whatever religious service you attend. Uh, and I want to know if I had a video of you in church, whether or not I would think that you were ADHD. How many of you are likely to be off task, digging in your pocketbooks, uh, talking to your neighbor, squirming in your seat, picking at your fingernails, uh, looking at all sorts of insignificant, reading the program over and over even though you're not interested in what it has to say? And I expect... <clears throat> If I could see some of you in, uh, in that situation, that I would include uh, your attention might not be the best either. Uh, so <clears throat> usually when we require people to be in a setting that isn't particularly motivating for them or isn't particularly entertaining or isn't a subject that enthralls them, we expect to see their attention lapse. And when their attention lapses, we see all of these other kinds of off-task behaviors as they strive to uh, uh, entertain themselves in other kinds of ways. <clears throat> The truth is when you misbehave in church or when you don't pay attention in church or whatever, uh, it isn't necessarily because you have an attention deficit disorder. It may well be uh, because you're not particularly motivated by what the speaker has to say. I don't know about other religions, but I know uh, quite a bit about the Protestant religion, having been dragged to church every single Sunday of my entire life. And there's a reason why the sermons in the Protestant church are only 20 minutes long. When you go to church, what happens? You go in, you sit down, the preacher says, says stand up, say a little prayer, sit down. Says a few words, you get up, you sing a song, <clears throat> you sit back down, you say another prayer, and then the sermon starts. And how long does it last? Out of that whole hour that you're in church, the sermon only lasts about 20 minutes, right? Why do you think that is? Probably the sermon only lasts 20 minutes because that's about as long as even adults can pay attention to a sermon. What do you think? Yet we expect children to come to school, sit down, <clears throat> and pay attention for seven and a half hours with just an occasional break here and there and an occasional occasional change of tasks and activities and of course many of them are unable to do that and <clears throat> some of them are unable to do that not because they have poor attention but because they have other intervening issues it may be the fact that um, that their affect is is uh, is off base for that day. They may be depressed or they may be unhappy about outside events. It could be that they're not motivated to uh, learn this topic because it's very boring to them. 
There are lots of things that we attend to because they are high probability behaviors for us. We pay attention to them because they're intrinsically motivating. They're things we want to find out more about. And then there are other subjects we're all required to learn that are not motivating and not inherently interesting to us and it requires a great deal of discipline to make ourselves pay attention to things that aren't intrinsically motivating. But those are not the only things. Uh, another thing has to do with task commitment. How long are you willing and able to effort on something that isn't particularly interesting to you? We've talked about that before in here. Many of you are willing to effort over tasks, uh, your studies, at great length. And it isn't because you have a wonderful teacher, and it isn't because the material is entertaining, and it isn't because the uh, material has of any interest to you. You continue to effort because you believe that your efforting will pay off in a way that makes it worth your while to effort. <clears throat> so the extent to which we are willing to work or effort at something and the extent to which we're able to discipline ourselves to do so often has to do with, uh, with the expectation of the outcome that is going to accrue to us if we do in fact engage in that behavior. So task commitment often becomes then a product of our self-efficacy. When I say self-efficacy, I'm talking about the extent to which we feel empowered to, to learn this or master this or be successful at it if we keep trying. It is our feelings of ability with regard to how the outcome of, of our effort will progress. So there's really a very seamless relationship that intertwines in a child at any given point in time that, that involves his affect, his motivation, his attentional abilities, his feeling of efficacy, his uh, task commitment, and all of these things interact at one time when he is presented an activity and determines whether or not he will persist in this activity or whether or not he will engage in some sort of avoidance behavior or entertain himself some other way. So one of the things that I, I want you to start thinking about is when we have children who have attentional problems, the possibility that some of these other factors are involved because we can often manipulate a child's ability or willingness to pay attention by manipulating consequential events, by enhancing his motivation, by providing success experiences that will instill in him a self-efficacy and so on and so forth. But no, too often we rule it out and say, oops, well, he can't learn it. He didn't do it. He has attention deficit disorder. That's the end. So sorry. Send him to special ed. And the truth is, it isn't that simple. Many of you do and procrastinate and become distracted from things and there's absolutely nothing wrong with you whatsoever. I'll tell you another problem with regard to attention. We always talk about kids who have attention deficit disorder. That implies that they don't have enough attention, right? They can't pay attention enough. But attentional abilities are a lot like eating disorders. Did you know that kids can pay attention too much? What is it called when a child pays attention too much? Huh? Uh, no, we were talking about that before. She said, would it be OCD, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder? And I can see why you said that. 
uh, and, and in a way, maybe that is over-attention, either over-attention or, or inappropriate attention to events that are inconsequential, even though we know, in, in a cognitively, we know that touching that grocery store card handle won't make us sick. Emotionally, we believe that it will, <coughs> so we're very reticent to do so. But really, the opposite of attention deficit is called perseveration. This is the inability not to attend, but the inability to stop attending at appropriate times. In other words, when we say to a child, it's time to put your work away, what do we anticipate he will do? Well, <laughs> Brianna said keep it out. Sometimes they do that, not because they're perseverating, just because they're trying to be oppositional that day. But occasionally you enter, encounter a child who's very into what he's doing and interrupting his attention to that task puts him into a fit. <clears throat> Years ago when I worked at the uh, psychiatric hospital, we had a little boy named Larry, and uh, I'm pretty sure that um, Larry probably had some pretty highly differentiated brain damage. I, I don't recall that really being on his, in his diagnosis. I'm not even sure we made that, di well, it wasn't a diagnostic category at that time in, in IDEA the way that it is now, but anyhow, in retrospect, I expect uh, Larry had some fairly you know, differentiated <clears throat> brain damage, but he had, uh, and he was borderline retarded there. He, he could do uh, quite a few things, and he could certainly progress academically, but he had a number of behavioral issues, which is how it is that he ended up in the psychiatric hospital to start with. But he was in the hospital, and primarily because his uh, psychiatrist thought that he had... Uh, hallucinations and delusions, which is sort of an interesting story that, that I'll tell you. Sometimes children learn, I think, uh, strange associations in their lives, and then other times they learn to get our attention by acting like they have psychotic behaviors because they can't get attention the appropriate way. But anyway, Larry's uh, doctor was very concerned about him because he had an elevator phobia. He was just terrified of elevators, and any time anyone would want him to ride an elevator or there was a need that you had to ride an elevator to get from one place to the next, <coughs> he just flipped completely out. He said, absolutely, he ain't riding no elevator, and would start screaming his head off if you made him do so. And what he said when he had these little episodes that his doctor thought were psychotic is he said, uh, Elevators and mud puddles, elevators and mud puddles, they're just alike. So we had a ward attendant at, at that time, she was a really good girl, and she decided she was going to help Larry get over his elevator phobia. So she would practice. In order to get from the children's ward to the, to the coffee shop every day, he had to have some interaction with this elevator. She was trying this technique, it's called systematic desensitization. I don't know you ever need to know that, but the idea is if you get closer and closer and closer to something, you'll eventually get used to it and it won't be so scary to you anymore. So every time he would get a little bit closer to the elevator, she'd take him to the coffee shop and buy him a Coke. So <clears throat> he got to where he could walk past the elevator and then walk past the elevator and touch it then stand in front of the elevator and touch the button. And every time that he would get a little bit closer, well, this young lady would take him down to the coffee shop and get him a Coke. So finally she got where he would, she would get in the elevator and turn it off and he would step in the elevator with her. Anyway, the big day came finally that they were gonna ride the elevator down to the coffee shop to get the Coke. He got in the elevator and the door closed and he started screaming at the top of his lungs. He just had a fall down fit and started screaming, elevators and mud puddles, they're just alike, they're just alike. She was so frustrated, she took him by the shoulders and said, Larry, why do you keep saying that? They're nothing alike. And he said, they are too, people get stuck in them. 
So this psychotic episode to Larry made perfect sense. And when we shared that with his mother, she said, now I know why he thinks that, because he had had a bad experience with an uncle who got stuck in an elevator. So we draw the wrong conclusions about children sometimes. And once we understood what he was thinking, it was easy to talk to him about the fact that people do sometimes get stuck in elevators, but most of the time they don't. And, uh, and certainly there was uh, much less concern about his psychosis than there was uh, previously. But <clears throat> even when that problem was solved, he was still very perseverative. He loved to draw pictures of Ferris wheels. Apparently, he hadn't made the connection between people of Ferris wheels falling because they didn't scare him at all, and I don't guess he worried about getting stuck in them anyway. He loved Ferris wheels. And he could do these fabulous pencil drawings of Ferris wheels, which he routinely did, and uh, shared. Um, the lady that I team taught with had one uh, frame. They were just a beautiful etchings. But when he started one of these Ferris wheels, it took him about an hour and a half or two hours to complete the picture. Well, there are not very many times in school that you can devote two hours to a free time activity. So we would try to interrupt, say, well, we'll need to put this up and you can finish it later. Well, he would completely decompensate. He could not stand to have his activity interrupted. So while it's wonderful for a child to be focused and motivated on, um, for activities, they also have to be able to stop and put them aside when it's appropriate to do so. Well, so the, the point I'm trying to make here for you is we really have a fairly narrow range that we're w willing to accept as normal attentional abilities. It's sort of like eating disorders. If you don't eat anything at all, that's one type of problem. Then if you eat too much, on the other hand, that's another type of problem. So we have to be very self-regulatory about some things, and attention is one of those things where we have to be, we expect a kid to be able to attend this much, but if he, he attends too much, that's not very good either. Well, this indicates to me something else. It indicates to me that attention is probably a characteristic that distributes on a normalized curve. There are probably some kids who are really good at paying attention, just innately good at it. It's easy for them to pay attention. Even if they're not very motivated, if they're not very committed to the task, if they don't have a great feeling of efficacy, it may just be easier for them to attend to start with. So there are all kinds of things that go into whether or not a child will sit down and actually execute a task that you've asked him to do. And you can't just say all of a sudden, boom, he's attention deficit disordered without thinking. Maybe he's just not very good at attending then. Maybe it isn't very motivating. Maybe he doesn't really believe if he pays attention and works real hard that he'll be successful. So all of these things may be coming together to paint a picture of a student who is, yes, Brianna? It seems like a lot of GT kids, uh -huh. they're really smart, but, um, and this, you know, doesn't say all GT kids, but they have trouble paying attention to one thing. Like, have you ever noticed that? Well, uh, you know, there's a whole area of, of gifted, of gifted disab disabled, gifted slash disabled children that has come into the foreground in the last few years. And I think with gifted children, uh, there's a number of things. You know, the, uh, Thomas Edison was a person who wasn't very good at school. You know, Einstein wasn't very good at school. We've heard about all of these people who are obvious geniuses but didn't do very well when they were in school. I think sometimes children who are very bright are very motivated and they tend to be self-starters. One of the things that we know about uh, cognition is that as children are less cognitively able, they're also less self-starters. 
So sometimes you have gifted children who have become very bright, have been interested in books, taught themselves to read when before they ever t started to school, and they are used to determining for themselves how they, what they're committed to and what they're going to attend to. So suddenly... They get in a structure of school before they've been able to explore and do and doll on their own and experiment and construct. And suddenly somebody says, oh, no, you only, you only do reading from 8 to 9.20. And then you only do math. Well, we know you like to do math, but we only do math from 9.20 to 10 o'clock. At 10 o'clock, you have to quit because we're going to do science. Well, I don't want to do science. I've been sitting at home mathing. You know, for since I was three years old, don't tell me I have to do science. I don't like to do science. And so we have these children who are very gifted, but they don't necessarily, first of all, they may not be gifted in every area. We know that from all the work on multiple intelligences. You know, sometimes you have children that have creative genius but they not, may not be very good at handling symbolic language. And so they're bright enough to want to do these things that they're good at, but they're not so capable at disciplining this, themselves to attend to and perform on tasks just because somebody said you need to. They may also be more intrinsically motivated. So it's the finding out, the act of discovering for them that's more important than the reinforcement that comes in the form of teacher approval and grades and these kinds of things that we use to reinforce kids in school. So <clears throat> once again, you have to look at a child. I'm telling you the answer to teaching children who are not doing what they're supposed to do when they're supposed to be doing it, is to look at each one and say, I wonder what makes this one tick. And scratch your head and say, hmm, I think he could do this if he wanted to. What, why isn't he doing it? Does he not believe he can? In which case, I need to give him real simple activities and give him experience in being successful so he will believe that he can. Um, does he not do this because he's not motivated? If so, if we put it in the context of Ferris wheels for Larry Mitch, or Larry, would he then want to do it if he thought these words coming around that he was supposed to identify are really in a Ferris wheel? Would he be interested in learning them? <clears throat> what is it that is presenting in this child that is causing him not to do what I want him to do. Or maybe, can he just not pay attention long enough? In which case, we may need to structure some other one-to-one -one type learning for him. It's all a, a secret, and there's no answer. That's one reason all the classroom management things, you will never come up with a classroom management system that works for everybody all the time. There, there won't. I could not figure out a way to come up with something that would reinforce every one of you at the same time for all the things that we talked about when we talked about motivation. You may have access to it in other places. You may not believe you can get it. All of these things come into play. And they come into play not only with motivation, but motivation is such a huge component of, of attention and whether or not a child is willing and able to attend to the task at hand. So while we know that all... Uh, uh, students <coughs> exhibit lapses in attention from time to time just like you may or may, may have exhibited lapses in your attention to church. Students with disabilities are more likely to exhibit inattention. We know that kids with mental retardation uh, <coughs> have difficulty attending uh, unless the stimulus cue in the lesson is very uh, uh, eye-catching for them. We know that students with disabilities such as hearing impairments, uh, their attention often lags because listening is such an effortful task to them. I, I have read this over and over, but one of the things that I have noticed in myself, I never watch television, but I listen to it all the time. And I'll listen to a program and I can follow it just by hearing the different characters and listening to what they say. 
But if I'm listening to a character that speaks a foreign accent, like the British BBC shows were on a lot and Miss Marple and all those people spoke with a very heavy British accent, I would find I would never listen to those shows even though I liked them. And the reason is why it was too effortful. You know, I don't have to listen to anybody. I'd, at listening is not a conscious act if someone is speaking pretty standard English for me. So I don't have to pay attention. But, and I can understand anyone who speaks a thread of the English language. It doesn't make any difference how heavy their accent is. If I've listened to them a little bit, I can get what they're saying just like that. But the reality is it requires more effort and more attention on my part. So when I'm home washing the dishes, fixing supper, making the beds, running the vacuum and that sort of thing, I got to listen to something that is not effortful, that just falls on my ears and makes sense without any effort on my part. And when I figured that out about myself, I thought that's why it is so difficult for children uh, with hearing disabilities to pay attention. They, at listening to them is a conscious act at all times. They have to pay attention. It's effortful for them to listen. So all of these kinds of things come into play. Now, <clears throat> your book, uh, I believe in the last chapter, I'm not sure exactly where it is. Your book uh, talks about the horses that pull the chariot of learning and they refer to ability uh, affect and motivation as these three things that converge to determine whether or not a student will reach an instructional objective. But I think there are lots of other horses too. I think that attention, memory, task commitment, self-efficacy has to do with all of these things. But one thing that we can consider above all others and uh, it's the subject of a great deal of this chapter and that is that really attention is a necessary condition for learning to occur. So what I want you to remember when you start teaching to avoid many of those initial errors that emerging teachers make, I want you to keep in mind at all times that attention is a necessary though insufficient characteristic for learning to occur. Ch if children are not paying attention, if they are not paying attention, it is a lead pipe cinch that they will not be learning anything. Often you see teachers who are beginning, or, or maybe you've had this experience in your collaborative you sit down and you start teaching. You've got your lesson. You're so excited. You're so prepared. You sit down and you start teaching. And all that's fine and good, except maybe nobody's listening. In which case, you can rest assured that learning will not occur. In order to have any opportunity for the students to be motivated, to feel empowered, to be capable, what you have to have initially is their attention. So for that reason, I think it's important for you to bear in mind that attention is a necessary, though insufficient, condition for learning to occur. And there are any number of preconditions that you can engage in as teachers to see that you not only capture their initial attention, but that you uh, maintain their attention to the, to the extent they are capable of attending. And uh, one of those, of course, is to have changes in the volume and the tone and everything in your voice. Nothing is worse than listening to someone who talks in a monotone. So it's important for you to have enthusiasm and to vary the tone of your voice and the volume and this sort of thing. Um, it's important for you to call on the students and involve them with the participation and contributions of their own and make sure that contributions are acknowledged and positively rewarded when they occur. It's nothing is any more effective than humor and having fun with the kids and doing things that they think are fun or exciting. Having enthusiasm about the subject that is, is at hand and having interesting and motivating and 
relevant uh, enhancers for your lesson. Lots of times we can use attention getting demonstrations like, like the use of real objects or the cognitive uh, disconnects that we talked about last week. These things are often important. Sometimes kids do get off task and when that happens we need to, to intervene and make sure we bring them back to where we are. One technique that uh, is recommended in this chapter but was also mentioned in classroom management is direct appeal. It's okay to, to talk to a child in a very covert and unobtrusive way and say, gosh, I need you to be paying attention right now. This is important. So I'd like for you to listen to me. Sometimes we don't have to go that far. Sometimes we can draw the kids back in by proximity control, just being near where they are when they're drifting off. But you have got to exhibit the withitness to know when your students are with you, to, uh, to adjust your pacing, to bring them back to your task at hand if you notice that they're out there somewhere. And um, breakup activities are awfully good. Rather than giving them lots and lots of time to work on something, give them a little bit of time, redirect them to something else, give them another time. There's lots of things to do. Little kids, as we know, or I don't know if you do or not, but you should after taking human growth and development, you should know that children's attention span varies over time. What little children have shorter attention spans. I, I don't know. I'll, I think a five-year-old's average attention span is about 15 minutes and a six-year-old's att average attention span is 20 minutes. I remember the first graders because, of course, I used to be a first grade teacher. So you can make book on the fact that about every 20 minutes kids are going to get off task if you, if you continue to do the very, very same thing. Their attention is going to waver. And when you consider the analogy that we talked about earlier with the sermons in church being about 20 minutes, we don't do a whole lot better as adults sometimes if it's not something that we're interested in and motivated to pay attention to. So you can stop with, with uh, little kids who are five or six years old. They love to do things like reach for the ceiling, let them stretch and try to touch the ceiling or bend over and try to touch their toes or, you know, do just any kind of interruptive activity that lets them move around a little bit. If you want to keep the the everybody engaged thinking that you'll lose more time if you break the cycle of learning go down the aisle and tell get your children pattern to go get a drink of water why don't you start getting a drink and when you get back touch the person next to you so you can have the class moving at one at a time to take a water break or go to the restroom or whatever so they're breaking up their activities these kinds of things are important. You can do half of an activity before lunch and then come back and finish the activity. Uh, you can do that particularly with direct instruction, then have lunch and come back and do seat work on a subject for guided practice and reinforcement. So these kinds of things are very good at, um, at uh, punctuating your school day with uh, uh, breaks that will expand and increase the probability your students will be on task. I mentioned movement. You know, they they, they may just need to get up and move around for a little uh, uh, longer. Student activities uh, <coughs> are very good uh, if they're talking to someone else or listening to someone else or working with others in some way. Peers may be used to promote attention by having them uh, work together in pairs like we've talked about in cooperative learning. Uh, these kinds of things are all important for, for making sure that you've enhanced the probability that your students will attend to the maximum extent that they're able to do so. Uh, reinforcing kids for, for paying attention can be beneficial. You can set an alarm clock at random intervals or ring a bell at random intervals and reinforce everybody who's on task in that spontaneous time. And, uh, and 
those uh, things are very effective. You can even use an individual timer on a desk for a child who has difficulty. Kids who have difficulty paying attention almost always get off task during seat work. You know, when they are required to sit and work independently, it, uh, it, it may be more effortful for, for them than it is children who are more capably active more capable academically but sometimes you can use a timer and say I want you to finish your work today and let them know the pa relate to the passage of time and see how much time is passing and you can remind them halfway through are you halfway through with your assignment another thing if you have problems with a student completing a task reduce the amount of tasks that's required for a while. If you have a student who's never completed a 20 problem math worksheet, give that student a 10 page math worksheet and let the student finish that and then next tomorrow I give him 11 problems and the next day give him 12 problems and the next day give him 13 problems. So this student is learning the connection between paying attention and efforting over these tasks and being successful in completing them. Does that make sense to you? It's not the child who is making progress slowly that ends up in special ed. It is the child who doesn't make progress that ends up in special ed. When there's forward progress, the student is getting better. It's when the progress stops. And success is such an important dimension in self-efficacy and commitment to task and motivation to do things that are not intrinsically motivating that it's very important to structure your activities so students have the sense of empowerment the idea that they can that when they do things they're successful and good things happen to them as a result of it uh, Self-recording strategies can be very effective. They can also reduce your load. Um, Self-recording strategies can demonstrate to a child. I did, for example, if you have the child who never got through, give him the reduced workload and then let him chart on a chart how many tasks he's completed or let him monitor completion of his seat work task. And as he sees progress, he will be willing to undertake sufficiently longer and more detailed examples of work. We program kids, people for this all the time. Our bosses do us. They say, oh, you're doing a good job. Do this one more thing. You know, oh, you've done so fabulous. Oh, you work so hard. Just do a little bit more. I'm so proud of you. Just do a little bit more. You know, we, we do fall for that sort of social reinforcement all the time. All of us do. And respond to that. And children are no different. Um, I had a, an intern one time who, who went through our teacher education program here and, and uh, went to work at... Uh, at uh, Galena Park uh, Elementary School, which is very low SES, 100% free lunches. And uh, this young man was a fifth grade teacher in that setting. And uh, he ran his entire classroom with the students doing self-recording. He had its, his whole class set up like a town Everybody, he created jobs for all the students in his classroom. They had to apply for a job. They got a job. They were paid in money. When they got their money, they could buy a house or open a business. And uh, in the middle of all of this, I went to observe him one day. And I said, oh, this is remarkable. I was there for about an hour. And these fifth grade students, every in this very... Uh, at risk population. I mean, kids that you would think would, by the fifth grade, be tuned out and turned off and and misbehaving all of the time. Everybody was just doing exactly what they were supposed to do. They were on task. I was looking through the papers that he was turning back. Every child was passing and ma mastering the objectives of the class. And. I asked him how he felt about this, and he said, oh, he said, I love the system. The system's great. 
but whoo, it's a lot of work. All I do is monitor this progress. And I said, hire a banker. He said, you know, I never thought of that. He said, uh, I said, hire a banker. He said, what if they cheat? I said, hire an assistant banker. <laughs> Require two signatures. Well, hope they don't end up like, I hope he didn't end up like Enron, but I don't think he will. I think those fifth graders uh, won't figure out the system until they get move on to middle school. But these kinds of things, don't make it work for yourself. Let the kids do it. They get invested in it anyway. Feel ownership of it, and it's much more likely to be successful and effective then. But self-recording can be a very, very powerful strategy for making sure that things get done. They're monitored. You can see right there what they've done. It's great for reporting. But, but mostly, it's great for reinforcement and for motivation to increase their feelings of efficacy and their sense that they can. Um, you do, however, have to reward them sometimes for uh, being uh, accurate in their, in their recording. We know that many youngsters uh, who are poor achievers have great difficulty with basic skills. Basic skills are uh, not very motivating to learn. They're not very entertaining. Uh, nobody is really interested, I don't think. And all these gifted and talented kids that Brianna talked about are not just thrilled at the notion of mastering uh, basic skills. They may want to invent things or they may want to create things or they may be fabulous at, uh, at uh, working out math equations, but basic skills are probably not going to be their cup of tea. On the other hand, children who are very low achievers also have a great deal of difficulty with basic skills. So many kids are much less attentive because not only because they're not motivated for basic skills but they don't have the basic skills necessary uh, for participating in class they may not know how to take notes they may not be able to read on grade level to obtain the information that they need from their science and social studies books for example and in this case it's very important that we find ways to accommodate these students needs such as as maybe reducing the number of problems or typing, having another student type some of the things they need to read or the information they need to get. Because after children are in about the third grade, oftentimes the grades that they earn in science and social studies and geography and, and in areas that have nothing to do with reading are really not a measure of how effective they are at science or social studies. It becomes a measure of how well they can read because in order to perform these tasks and to do what they need to do, they have to read to be able to do it and, uh, and they're not able to read. So they do not have the requisite skills necessary to complete the task. So not only are they failing in reading, they're also failing at science and social studies and these other things. Uh, and in some cases, uh, they may not be able to process the oral language as fast as it's spoken. Children who have difficulty understanding language or children who have sort of assimilation and retention problems, All, uh, children who just don't have a great deal of facility in oral, oral type skills may not be able to assimilate the language as quickly as it's spoken. So we may need to provide them instructions at a much slower rate or in a different way or have them posted so they can see exactly what they're supposed to do. One of the things we tend to do as teachers is we say, oh, well, I want you to uh, Put up your reading workbooks and get out your math book and uh, be sure and get out a pencil and sharpen your pencil and open your book to page 37 and on page 37 you're going to see 47 problems and of those 47 I want you to do the odd numbers and be sure and remember to write your name on the piece of paper. You know, this poor little kid that's not very oral oral, he's still scratching his head there now. I think she told me to put away my uh, language arts book and he doesn't have a clue. So I think in human 
relations, it doesn't make any difference if you're dealing with children or if you're dealing with adults. I think it's the same thing is true of parent-teacher conferences. If you have a parent-teacher conference, you better hold what you have to say to the three most important things. Because not very many people can retain more than three things that occur at a time. So when you have a parent conference, you better say, you better rehearse in your mind, it's real important that he finishes his homework. And it's real important that his parents reinforce him for completing his seat work because he hasn't completed any seat work this six weeks. So you think, in your mind, these are the two most important things, completing his seat work and turning it in and completing his homework and turning it in. So you get to the conference and you say, well, I've been having some problems with Billy lately. Uh, he took food off of somebody's tray in the cafeteria, and oh, by the way, he got in a fight today on the playground, and uh, he's really not getting along very well with his peers, and I have some concerns with him. He blurts out answers all the time, and blah, 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 and you're 30 minutes up, and you say, oh, by the way, he needs to complete his homework, and, uh, and he needs to complete his seat work, so be sure and give him a gold star if he brings home a paper with seat work. The parent goes home and scratches his head and says, he got in a fight with Billy in the cafeteria. I guess I'm supposed to give him a whipping. So it's important that when we, even with adults, that we don't overwhelm them with the information. It didn't really matter that he got in an argument with Billy at lunch. Tomorrow you can seat him by Mary instead. But it's real important that he brings his homework and he finishes his seat work so that his grades will improve and he will... Uh, I have a better attitude about coming to school and meeting the expectations in that learning environment. Well, it's the same thing with little kids. What you need to do is tell them, everybody, put away your language arts workbook. We're going to change activities. And it's only when everybody has their language arts books put away that we move on to say, Get out your math book and open it to page 67. There isn't anything else to say until everybody has their book open to page 67. Then you say, get a pencil and paper and work the odd numbered items. And when everybody started, They'll let you know if they have the need to sharpen their pencil because kids love to sharpen their pencils down to nothing, especially when they get bored, right? So think of these kinds of things because uh, they're very important for increasing the probability that kids will pay attention to what you're saying, but also that you'll have more engaged time in learning and all of the other things that go along with having students uh, who are on task in a learning environment. Uh, we talked a minute ago about perseveration or the notion that uh, too little of the ability to pay attention is the attention deficit disorder, but also there is too much of a good thing is perseveration. Uh, Intensive teacher-led instruction is also a way in which we, we can increase uh, extreme cases of, of attention deficit uh, disorder. These kids may need one-to-one -one instruction from a teacher or in, in severe cases, children may come to you with an aide who participates in their one-to-one -one instruction. <clears throat> I have seen children before who either because of organic problems or because of learning are really so off task so much of the time that you really cannot get them to do much of anything unless you sit with them on a one-to-one. -one. 
even though autistic children probably have something going on in this area, their attentional factors may follow this uh, example as well. You may have a child who's autistic who absolutely will not attend to a task unless uh, he's in a one-to-one -one relationship with an adult. So intensive teacher-led instruction is often an intervention that we recommend. Uh, <clears throat> You may be in a position to recommend a stimulant medication uh, for uh, students with ADHD. There are a range of psychostimulants uh, that are used uh, for children. Um, uh, the original one was Ritalin, but now there is a whole variety of other uh, psychostimulants that are often uh, prescribed for children with this disorder. It's a quite controversial topic right now. Uh, much ado is being made over the increasing number of children who are receiving medication and whether it's all needed, whether it's appropriate, and, and also the extent to which it is really useful. According to your book, and this is important for you to know, uh, according to your book uh, about 75% of all children who receive medication uh, for ADHD, in fact, show benefits from their medication. One of the things that I think you will want to do as a teacher is monitor any child who is put on medication during the time that he is in your room. If we say that that medication is justified if in fact the child gets better, which I think it probably is. I mean, if we have a child who actually becomes better and his performance is greatly enhanced and he's becoming, uh, feeling more efficacious about his ability to complete his schoolwork, he's more eligible for rewards, he's therefore more motivated. There's a lot of, um, a lot of rationale that you can put in place for the use of these psychostimulants. On the other hand, if they don't sh demonstrate any good over time, there's very little need to take the risk of, of administering these drugs. So if you have a child who's put on medication, you need to monitor that child's behavior very, very closely and objectively because you can't remember. You have to have some system of evaluating the number of minutes that he's on task or the number of times you have to redirect his attention back to the task at hand. You have to have an objective way of evaluating the extent to which the medication is improving his behavior. Otherwise, there's no point in in involving the child in any possible side effects or risks of the medication if we're not sure that it's, it's helping. And my feeling is that children often take these medications and they show a lot of uh, progress at first and then they develop a, sort of a, build up a tolerance for the medication and gradually their behavior deteriorates. And if this is the case, if the, if the behavior is not greatly improved and it isn't improved over time, then we probably need to think about some other uh, interventions for this child rather than medication. We certainly need to have this information available and it's our professional responsibilities. We're with children half of their waking hours. Now that's a scary <coughs> thought, isn't it? But you're with a child probably as much as a working parent is going to be with the child every week. If you're with that child seven and a half hours and um, except for weekends, you'll probably be with the child as much as the parent because probably after about seven and a half hours passes at home, it's bedtime. So we need to be very accurate in reporting how children are impacted by the medication and whether or not it is having the desired effect. Now, <clears throat> we really talk a little bit earlier about attention uh, being a necessary but insufficient condition for learning to occur. But when we talk about memory, we're talking about something else that is also a psychological process that is extremely critical for school learning. 
because if we teach children something one day and they don't know it the next, it's probably not the experience for them has not been very valuable. I would even go on further than this and say it's not only important for them to remember it, but it's also important for them to be able to generalize it to non-academic settings. We've talked about generalization before and the problems that less uh, cognitively adept youngsters have with generalization, how difficult it is to apply previously learned information in unique settings and so on and so forth. But if this sort of memory doesn't call up the information that's learned, the learned information is basically useless. Most of the time, even children who are very low achievers, once they have really learned and overlearned a subject, they will remember it for extended periods of time and maybe for the rest of their lives. I mean, I'm sure there's some of you who still remember the names of the, the seven continents and the nine planets and the uh, seven seas and all of the things that you learned in school. So lots of time, even non-essential information, we remember over periods of decades, not only months and years, but over decades. But certainly it's very important for children to learn uh, concepts and processes and principles and things like this, commit them to memory and retain it for long periods of time, and certainly in the end be able to generalize it to unique settings. Uh, we know that some children, uh, particularly those with TBI, may have problems with long-term memory. This is a fairly unique situation, but occasionally you may encounter the child who you can teach how to do uh, addition with regrouping today. He can do a work page with 20 problems on it, and he comes back tomorrow, and it's like it's never, he's never seen this in his entire life. It's very unusual, but it does happen. Most of the time, if we can ever get anything from the short-term memory into the working memory and let it filter down a little bit, and give the child repeated exposures to it with, with brief lapses, that child retains and remembers that information. And of course, it's critical for learning to be useful and the information that we impart in school to really be relevant and meaningful for the child in, the, in his post-secondary years. There are two aspects of memory primarily that we are concerned about. One of them is semantic memory. This is a lot of our basic skill information. The memory of facts and concepts and about the world. Uh, um, these are things like the names of the continents, the location of Houston, what our climate is, uh, what the economic circumstances are in the various regions of the country. All of these facts and figures are part of our semantic memory and they really constitute a great deal of what school is made up of, for better or worse probably, but nevertheless a lot, lot of our tax things are based on semantic memory. But in addition to semantic memory there's also episodic memory or the ability we have to uh, remember events, remember uh, what happened to us, remember when we had an automobile accident, remember last Christmas, remember a vacation to the Bahamas, remember uh, these kinds of things that have transpired in our lives, the knowledge and cognizance of our family members, our friends, our acquaintances, the roles that they played, the events that took place, plays that we've seen, all of this sort of thing has to do with episodic memory. And both of these things are very important, as are both our long-term and short-term memory. As I mentioned to you a little earlier, when kids have severe deficits in long-term memory, it's often associated with traumatic brain injury. Uh, we talked about brain injury a little bit earlier, but it's such a, um, an unusual 
diagnostic classification because the characteristics that are exhibited, the disability characteristics exhibited by children with TBI are so wide ranging. You may have one child who has TBI who has no difficulty whatsoever with long term memory and another one uh, who can't remember anything the next day but has a perfectly docile personality whereas one of them may be impo very impulsive and explosive and and um, erratic in behavior. So there are a wide range of symptoms associated with uh, TBI, but one of them is sometimes the ability, uh, inability to exhibit long-term memory for information acquired in school. And I do believe they are the most frustrating children in the world for teachers to teach because you have a learning experience. They have they have the aha moment and see what you're talking about, understand what you're talking about, and can do the operation that you're trying to teach them to do over and over and over and over today, then tomorrow it's gone. These children do eventually make progress in the skills that they acquire, but it's very, very slow because they don't have a normal ability to retain what they got today and rehearse it again tomorrow and the next day and so on and so forth. Our short-term memory, on the other hand, is our working memory. This refers to information that we hold in our conscious mind for just a few minutes and then we either use it and put it in our memory bank or we send it on. How many of you, tell me the truth, I know already before I ask, how many of you have used your cell phone while driving your car to get a number from information that uh, you needed to dial right then? Everybody has. I know the whole world has done this. That is why I do believe that they started having the directory assistance on your cell phone dial for you. Otherwise, we'd probably all be out on the freeway killing each other, right? But in that lapse of time between when they dialed for you and, and uh, when you got your cell phone, you had to remember the number they gave you long enough to punch those numbers in your phone while still driving your car, drinking your coffee, and visiting with your sister, right? How did you do it? Huh? Huh? You held it in your short-term memory. How did you do that, though? How did you do that? Getting it over and over. I don't know. Let's try it. I'm going to give you my telephone number. Yes. When I try to remember something, I try to, like, sing it or something. All right, well, I'm going to give you a chance. Sing this. No writing. You cheaters. 713-622-5368. Now sing. 713-622-5368. Six two, seven one three six two two, five three six eight. You devised. A, you said, "Okay, I know she's going to say this. This is how I'm going to remember it." I had to change my whole strategy when we started having to dial area codes. <laughs> Because I'd spend my short-term memory remembering 713 or 281 or 832. So I don't do that anymore. I don't even think about that. You know what I do? I think about, uh, well, no, I don't even do that. I think about geographic regions. If it's 7, I think it's my side of town. And, and, and if it's 281, I think north. And if it's 832, I think cell phone. I've never known anybody with a landline that had an 832 exchange. So I think, okay, so I'll do that right away. Then I concentrate on the other seven numbers. But if somebody's riding in the car with me, I say, I'll say, I remember the first three, you remember the last four. <laughs> and, I, and so I'll remember the area code in those first three and then say, what are the last four? And I will, they have completely dismissed those from my mind. But we all do these things, don't we? Because we only want to dial that number once. 
if in fact this is the combination to your locker at school or if this is the procedures for brushing your teeth or turning on your computer or whatever, you have to shift that information into your long-term memory bank so that you can call it up at a later point in time. So both of these types of memory, the short-term or the working memory, and the long-term or retention factor are very, very important for children to be successful in school. Um, like with, uh, with uh, what we were talking about earlier with attention, there are some preconceived conditions that will enhance the probability that your children will remember, focus on, and remember what is said in your classroom. One of, one of the things is, is maintaining an organiz, organized and distraction-free environment. That's another thing. I don't know, distraction-free, that almost gets into attention where I'm concerned. But it is an important variable. You cannot expect children to concentrate on their mass seat work when their Easter bunny from show and tell is sitting on top of their desk. It's just not going to happen. So until you get rid of that Easter bunny and that Easter basket, there won't be a great deal of math work, and before long they'll be fighting over the chocolate eggs if they're sitting there. You can write that in ink. I'll tell you a challenge I had one time. I had a little girl, and I had great sympathy for this challenge too, I might add. I had a little girl that rode her stick horse to school every day. And she loved that stick horse. It was her very favorite thing. She, her name was Beth, and I just adored this little girl. She was a first grader. And uh, we had her in the hospital, and she was very attached to this stick horse, and she rode it, what, rode it to school every day. And, uh, boy, if you try to take that stick horse away from her, guess what? Whoo, she threw a fit. I mean, of course, you can do that, but, you know, when you make it so disagreeable, when you make following the rules so disagreeable, you get rid of the stick horse, but the kid hates you. So you've really won the battle, but you've lost the war. So I thought, I have got, of course, once you got the, I stopped making deals with her. Okay, you can bring your horse to school, but you can't play with him. Well, of course, that lasted about five minutes, you know. She, oh, she'd do anything to get to bring him to school, and then five minutes, eight, which the temptation was too great. She had to play with her stick horse. So finally, I came up with a solution. Guess what it was? Huh? Put it in the barn. Well, you're close. That was a good one. She said, put it in the barn, and that was a good one. I didn't think of that one, but what we had in the hospital were the rails, you know, the disability rails around the sides. So I turned the disability rail outside the classroom into a hitching post. And so we hitched him, to, we had to hitch him to the hitching post every day before she came to school, and then we let her, you know, get him, um, ride him at recess and things like that. But those kinds of things have got to go. So I don't know if you want to call it uh, aiding attention or aiding memory, but certainly a well-organized, distraction-free environment is a necessary precondition. And certainly the notion of organization, the organization of things does have to do with memory because we want to remove as much of the non-essential stimulus as possible from what needs to be remembered. Motivation, of course, is an important aspect of memory. Students will be more likely to learn and more likely to recall what they've learned if they're interested in what it is and if they can assess its future relevance to them. If it's fun, if it's enjoyable, if there's an interaction component with peers, if it is constructed out of real life experiences or experiences that they see are relevant to them, it's much uh, more likely to result in uh, in uh, long-term uh, learning and, and, and memory. Um, your book spends a lot of time talking about meta-memory. Now, I think you ought to know what metacognition is. Do you know what metacognition is? This is an important concept, not only for, 
for now, but also for your exit test. If, if we say that metacognition is thinking about thinking, I mean, cognition is basically thinking, right? The mental operations that go into reasoning, figuring, remembering, and so on and so forth. So if we say that metacognition is thinking about thinking, then metamemory becomes thinking about remembering. We know, and we'll talk more next week when we get to study skills, we know that children who are more gifted academically are more likely to come up with their own metacognitive strategies. They'll learn how to think about thinking, and they will learn how to think about learning things and, and knowing how to figure things out. They'll make associations. Well, I tried this when I was learning to multiply. Maybe it will work for division. Meta-memory is very much the same thing. It's thinking about remembering. And when I gave you that example a minute ago about remembering the telephone number, many of you probably said, I know how I'm going to remember this because you have rehearsed that strategy before when you really had to remember phone numbers just to call on a one-time basis. Uh, God bless you. Uh, in any event, your book spends a lot of time talking about meta, uh, meta memory or the uh, act of thinking about how you might remember things and how you might enhance your memory skills and, uh, and enhance the memory skills of the students in your classroom so that their uh, learning on academic tasks is increased. And one strategy for doing this is really the use of external devices. We do this all the time. We make lists. We keep uh, uh, phone and address books. We um, uh, put things, uh, objects in a conspicuous place so we won't forget where they are. In other words, you may hang your uh, keys uh, on a hook by your back door so that you see them. I have a place by my back door where I put everything that I need to take with me. And I always look there. I mean, I can hardly miss it. You know, I, sometimes I do anyway, but most of the time I can't get out the back door without seeing my little desk and I see my lunch and my phone and my purse and, and my water bottle and all of the things that I need to take with me. So these are external devices. They're things we use and depend on outside of ourselves uh, uh, to help us with our memory. And, um, and of course, the busier we become, the older we get, the more important some of these external devices are for our memory. But the another thing we do sometimes is, is we devise strategies to enhance the meaningfulness of what it is that we're supposed to remember. And we do this by association and by making things more meaningful to children, more relevant to children, or more closely associated with things that will help them remember. And we're going to go into a whole variety of those strategies after the break. But right now, it's about time for the break. So I want to stop for a few minutes, give you a chance to uh, to uh, uh, move around and wake up. And I'll see you in a minute.